For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 91 years, Strand is the sole survivor still run by the Bass family and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I'm excited to welcome Ziedan Yusefsi. He was a teacher, is an education activist, and is the co-founder and board member of Malala Fund, which was founded in 2013 to champion every girl's right to 12 years of free, safe, quality education. We are gathered here tonight to celebrate his book, Let Her Fly. Joining him is Taylor Royal, CEO of Malala Fund. Please join me in welcoming them to Strand. Hello, good evening, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Taylor, and I work for Malala Fund, which is an organization that's dedicated to making sure that every girl can go to school. And in this role, I spend a lot of time with tonight's featured author, and I hope that by the end of this evening, you'll get to know him as well. In a moment, Siyadi and Yusuf Zai is going to read selections from his book, Let Her Fly. This beautiful book is an adventure story, and a love story, and a story of loss and tragedy and forgiveness and triumph. It's also an inspiration and a resource for parents, particularly fathers, who are trying to raise empowered daughters and enlightened sons. So I hope that you'll pick up a copy for the fathers in your life, for your friend, um, or for yourself tonight. So Zidin is a truly remarkable man. You may know how he risked his life to protect his daughter's education and her equality. But he's also a teacher, a poet, an activist, and the world's favorite feminist father. Please welcome Ziyadine Yusufzai. Thank you, Taylor, for this nice introduction, and thank you to Strain for having me here. Uh, actually, this is the first ever publicity event of my book in USA. So thank you so much to Strand for hosting it. Um, as Taylor told you, uh, I'm Ziauddin Yusufzai, and once Malala was my daughter, now I'm her father. <laughs> uh, I feel so good about it, so proud of it. Uh, let me read, as uh, Taylor told you, that I will read a few passages of my uh, book. Uh, first one, I'm reading about my brilliant and beautiful wife, Torpeke. She's here. Would you like to stand? But they have seen you already. She's here. Mm. Here I start it. Sometimes I ask myself what would have happened in my life had Torpeke not been my wife. I think I would have struggled to bring up children who believe deeply in gender equality like ours do, because how could I have instilled those ideas and values in them if their mother was not part of our family's journey? How would equality have come to mean anything to Malala? my uh, daughter, Khushal and Atal, my sons, if they had seen their mother live in my shadow. There would have been no bridge, bec uh, there would have been no bridge between us, husband and wife, and no bridge between Pekai and her children. In countries where there is a strong patriarchy, change has to come from wi wi women too. So, so many women all over the world are told from birth, birth that men are more important. There comes a time when they have to actively stop believing in this and claim that they are entitled to. This is why I call Torpeke my co-traveler. Torpeke was so, Torpeke was, is so important in the role of mother because she refused to chain Malala with all the, the, with all the lessons uh, she herself had been taught about being a girl. 
In Torpeke's childhood, girls were judged only by the honor they brought to the male members of the family, their father, their brothers, and their sons, and their determination never to bring upon the family any kind of shame. Shame is not only acting in a bad way, it can be acting in an, in, in an independent way. If a, girl, if a girl falls in love with a boy not chosen by her parents and meets him unshep, unchaperoned, I'm pronouncing it well, I think, unchaperoned. My, it's Pakistani, uh, I mean, pronunciation, so don't mind, OK? Um, meets him unchaperoned, this is considered shameful. Looking into the eyes of a man who is not your husband is a shame. There is a Pashtun saying, there is a Pashto saying, not Pashtun saying, there is a Pashto saying that the most honorable girl in the village, in other words, the best girl will always keep her eyes to the floor even when her village is on fire. This is a story told by Turpekai, and she knows she's smiling now. Um, uh, okay, um, will always keep her eyes to the floor even when her village is on fire. As a teenager, Pekai asked her mother what kind of girl would not look up to help when all around her people and homes are, 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 are burning. Uh, when uh, faced with this logic, her mother replied, oh Pekai, what can I say? because she was shocked with her argument. It was PK as a woman who was also courageous in the way she unlearned all ideas about the difference between boys and girls. Early in our marriage, first in Barkana, is the village where I was born. Early in our marriage, first in Barkana, and then shortly afterwards in Mengora, uh, there is the town we moved to in Swat, where we really began our own giant journey uh, towards freedom. I was struggling in life to become a teacher, and then to set up my own school, Pekai was so supportive. Even on our honeymoon, which we spent at my father's house, she did not complain when I went off every day to volunteer as a teacher in a high school where I once was a student. Looking back now, I see this is characteristic of her. She is a rock. Steady and self-assured with a heart dedicated to the needs of others. We never seem to have any money, and it saddened me so much when Pekai had to sell her wedding bangles. Now she has new one, but it's the story of long 90, 94 and 95. We never seemed to have any money, and it saddened me so much when Pekai had to sell her bidding bangles. Where could I find a job, a good opportunity, so that I could earn a living and provide for a future family while still enjoying a sense of pride from contributing to my community? It seemed hopeless. Neither Pekai nor I wanted to stay in Karshat or Barkana. Karshat is her, her uh, village, and Barkana is mine one. Pekai called me Khesta. Khesta is a Pashto word, means beautiful. Anyone knows Pashto in this gathering? Oh, my goodness. OK. Thank you. Uh, if you don't know Pashto, I, I, even then, thank, thank, thank you. No problem. Uh, Pekai calls me, uh, Pekai calls me Khesta from the beginning of our marriage. It means beautiful one, which I am not, by the way, but it's fine. <laughs> Uh, uh, it means beautiful one. My nephews called me this too. I am not beautiful, but it is lovely pet name that I still like hearing Pekai use, Khesta. She would say, if you do these good things for others, God will ensure that we are OK. Thank you. Uh, this is about Tur Pekai. And let me, uh, let me read a few paragraphs. Are you bored with it? Oh, that's good. I know. Uh, it's about my sons. They are very important, by the way. When Torpeke and I began to have a family, 
The beauty of our world mirrored the love inside our walls. I do feel that all families are, in their own way, institutions. I do feel that our families are, in their own way, institutions, undeclared informal institutions. We all have values, however, much they differ from family to family. These values are not like charts on the walls which with bullet points. They are both spoken and unspoken, and they fill the house. As, a, as parents, we hope they are ad adopted and practiced by every member of the family. As I become the father of sons as well as a daughter, I define my family as one that believed first and foremost in equality. We did not write on the walls of our house, all women and men are equal. All have freedom of speech. But our lives together echoed those values. Though the boys' births were celebrated by our extended family and the community in the way that Malala's was not, I was determined not to treat them any differently than her. Maybe a bit harder on them. I was determined to raise family in which all three children saw no preference between genders. I also wanted a family that believed in freedom of expression. I had learned from my father not to be demanding of a child who had something to express, whatever it was, from either their mind or their heart. But now, but now, but how was I to maintain these new values, living deep in a patriarchal society, when all around my boys were other boys and men who were schooled in the old ways? The, the, the way I, uh, I, I, I thought about it was that if my sons saw me behaving a certain way, they would think that way was a normal. If they saw that their mother could walk to the bazaar alone, that her voice was a valid as mine, that I respected her and loved her for who she was rather than for the roles and duties uh, 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 she performed for me, that there, there, that there uh, were no limits on their sister's future, they, surely this would set them on the different road themselves. I believe I believe that all children learn from what we do, not from what we teach. I believe that all children learn from what we do, not from what we teach. For our children, the role models had to be Torpe Kai and me. If Hushal and Athal, my sons, if Hushal and Athal could see me treating their mother and their sister with respect and a sense of equality, then that would help groom them to be the kind of men who would practice the same respect for the next generation. That is why I believe social change comes about. It starts with you. But to have constantly, but to have constantly said to the boys with the fervor that I felt in my heart, you are all human beings. There is no difference, no superiority. We are all equals. When all they really wanted to be doing was flying their kites, could have been counterproductive. So I never told them that they were supposed to treat M Malala e e equally. I just did it myself. I acted upon the things I believed in. It is such a good starting point. Ziauddin, I told myself, this is my name, OK? Uh, Ziauddin, I told myself, you do not need to give the boys lectures. Just live yourself. Just live your normal life. Have love. Have love. And love is what? Love is freedom. Love is respect. Love is equality. Love is justice. So I told myself, love your wife and be loved by her, and your children will learn from that. I clung to this, I clung to this when Taliban invaded our valley and filled our world with hatred and fear. And last, not least, about my daughter, Jani. Uh,
She was the baby I have been waiting for. It's a fair, it's it's fair to ask, why should I want to bring the girl into a world, into a patriarchal society, what was that was not set up to support her? But the answer is simple. When I thought about being a father to a daughter, I imagined my role as a completely different from the fathers I had seen around me when I was a son with sisters. When I myself was a boy with no girls in my class, I knew what kind of father I was going to be if I was ever lucky enough to have a daughter. I was completely clear about it. I was going to be a father who believed in equality and believed in a girl as she grows into a woman, and who raises her so that she believes in herself, so that in her life she can be free as a bird. I had helped women before Malala's birth. I had stood beside my cousin in support of her, and I had spent a lot of time thinking about my sisters, wishing I could do more to improve their lives. But really and truly, the first person in my life with whom I was able to start this journey of e equality was Malala. My own real active journey begins with her, because as I have said, change starts with you. M Malala was new and did not need to be shackled to the past. With her birth, I could see the potential of what she would offer with new eyes. My baby became like a touchstone for me. I was not w worried uh, that my society would cut this child. As I looked at her lying in her second hand cradle, I believed that she could do anything in the world. This beautiful child, and because I had faith in her, that was enough. But it is also true that I needed faith in my own position as her father. I had such instinctive, powerful love that I felt as long as I was beside her, supporting her, nothing could stand in her way. I look back and I see myself resolved and determined that those social norms, that these social norms I lived with, these traditions full of misogyny and male chauvinism would not cut her down. I was her shield. Thank you so much. Anyone have questions? OK, think about it. I'll start. In the last passage, you mentioned your sisters and your cousin. And I've heard you talk about them before as seeing their lives as the first time that you noticed that you were treated differently. Can you tell us about that? About my sister, then? Mm-hmm. Yeah, as uh, I mean, I grew up in a very uh, typical patriarchal family, five sisters, uh, an older br 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 brother. Uh, and I could see these uh, two different kind of parenthood in, under the same roof. People who belong to that area, they can understand. Um, like in the morning uh, breakfast tea, I had the privilege of uh, milk cream with my tea. My sisters had not that, uh, that thing. And then um, I had better clothes and more pair of shoes while they had not. And I think the worst discrimination that crippled my sister's future was deprivation of education. I had an opportunity to be in school. They stayed home. and. Uh, in patriarchal societies, the garments are also kind of patriarchal. 
like there was there were quite many school uh, for the uh, boys but there was hardly any school for the girls in that area so these this these were my beginning days where i grow and i could see as a child i might have enjoyed it uh, when i was very young like up to 7 8 years old but later on when i was 16 17 uh, my first cousin uh, just was bound in a forced marriage and uh, she had a very tragic story uh, which is in the book. Uh, if I tell that, it will take a long time. Uh, but she was suffering because of that marriage, and she could not come out of that bond because of the social pressure and social taboos. So these were the kind of circumstances that made me uh, kind of thinking differently. Uh, and um, I should say that one thing that changed me was education. Education transformed me to the kind of person that I am. It gave me the courage to be thinking differently, behaving differently, and doing things differently. Um, I still think it's remarkable, though, that you noticed that you were more privileged than your sisters, and that, that you noticed it enough that you wanted to help change it for your daughter and for all the other girls in your village. So what would you say to particularly men who are just fine, uh, making more money, getting cream in their tea, getting better clothes, letting their wife do all the work at home and also have her own job. What, what would you say to those men who haven't pushed themselves out of their comfort zone for equality yet? Yeah, I mean, men are sometimes. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I personally feel that when, especially in societies where there is patriarchy and it's not about my community it's in many countries around the world and when it is it 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 uh, when re religious extremism uh, is added to it then there is a very little space for uh, women and girls and uh, uh, patriarchy is like centuries old system of social values and social norms when you stand against it in the beginning, you feel discomfortable. Because all the people go one way and you want to go against the tide. It's quite hard and you sometimes doubt about yourself that what am I doing is right. My cousins are not happy with it. People in my community are like uh, staring towards me. Or they are suspicious about my masculinity and about my manhood uh, and they are and especially when you have mustaches and still behaving that, that is quite <laughs> typical. So in the beginning you feel, but, but, but I say that the first person uh, when you want to defeat the patriarchal thinking in your mind, the first person you come across is you. And when you defeat your old self and you find your comfort zone in your new self, then you are great and uh, then you start the change. But it will, the old self comes, pops up off and on, but you push him down. I'll tell you an in interesting story. When M Malala was leaving like uh, uh, one and a half year ago, she, uh, she was moving from uh, Birmingham to Oxford uh, to join LMH College. We were sitting at the table, dining table, and um, She's so cheeky, maybe she was teasing me or something, but she told me, look, Ab Abba, Abba in Pashto, father. Uh, you know that uh, I was in all girls school and now uh, I had not been together with boys and now I will be going to Oxford and it is a co-education system. There will be boys and I may invite uh, like people from the front team, other organization. Uh, and I'll be meeting like I will have an interaction with men. So what do you think, by the way? <laughs> and I just, after a pause, I told her, okay, Johnny, I trust you. Like a typical traditional father who is liberal outside, inside still there is patriarchy. <laughs> this is such a difficult thing. And when I said, uh, I trust you, believe me, what did she say? She said, don't trust me. <laughs> Don't trust me. So I tell people that your children fix you if you give a space to them. 
Because Khalil Gibran says that though your children are from you, but they are not supposed to be you. I mean, he says so beautifully, I can't phrase like him. But this is what he says, that they are the sons and daughters of the future. Why should you shackle them uh, with your past? And this is what my father did for me. He couldn't do it for his daughters, but he did it for me. He was a Maulana. And people who know me, uh, they know my family background. My father was a clerk in the mosque. He used to give five times, he was a prayer leader. And he used to give sermons every Friday. But he knew that the future is not there. The future is in modern education, it's in science, it's in technology. I was bad in science subjects, but it, in, anyway, it's in new languages, and that's why he put me in a school. So it was a change for him. I, I'm, uh, I uh, owe to him. Uh, so, sorry, I speak for so long. No, no, you're great. You're doing great. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for other people who might be about to send their children to college? Sorry, to? To university, for people, parents with kids going off to university. Uh, yes, I mean, my first child has been to university. Uh, there may be parents who have sent three, four. We should hear from them. But anyway, I, I, I think that we should enjoy this change in life. I have seen parents who are very worried and concerned and what will happen to my child being close to me. I think the best parenthood that you make your children independent and standing on their own two feet as early as possible. And let, and let be themselves. Um, you see, we miss Malala more than she misses us. <laughs> She's in Oxford. And it is, it is a complaint, but it's a comfort. We want her to be herself. And un until 19 years old, I used to be like, uh, uh, traveling with her like a guardian. Uh, like a father, sometimes her mother accompanied her. Now I'm enjoying my life. <laughs> she is going to France, to America, to Australia, to Canada, on her own. So this is what I wished in Pakistan. I remember that our last e e e e event, uh, which we both uh, talked uh, uh, in, in a conference, it was a black box event in Pakistan, Islamabad. And when I went to the stage, so I told that it's my dream that one day I want to see Malala to come from Mengora, like where we lived, to Islamabad on her own. It was a very innocent dream, you see? <laughs> so if it is happening now, I should be very happy, very grateful, and proud of her. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Yeah, you should ask some questions. Right. Please, thank you. Stand up. Oh, thank you. you Very quick, thank you. <laughs> okay, hello? Okay. How do you think your younger self would have reacted when told about your accomplishments as a father, author, and a co-founder of a fantastic foundation? Like, would you have believed it, or? <laughs> what uh, is, like? Asking how <laughs> would you, as like a 16-year-old, look at you now with all that you've accomplished? My kids? No, no. you. <laughs> I, Please, if you rephrase this question, I'm sorry. I want to understand you better. Please, you. It's okay. Yeah. Um, imagine you're 16 years old. How, like, let's say you had the opportunity to tell your younger self about your current accomplishments. How do you think you would have reacted at 16 years old? Okay. It's very nice to imagine myself 16 and Torpeke also 16 because that was the time we came together and, like, um, uh, yeah, really, I mean, the accomplishment you see, I mean, to be honest, this was not my choice of life. We have a wonderful network of Gulmaki champions. Our CEO is here. And Gulmaki champions are Malala Funds Project who are the champions for education in different countries like Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and Syrian region, Brazil. Jordan, Lebanon, and we have gatherings every year, global gathering. Let's make this story short. And I always tell them, to the Gulmaki champions, that my first choice that I chose for my life were you. I never imagined myself 
being in New York or in London or in UN and a global platform. For me, the blessing was to be in my own homeland, working for my community. These are circumstances that have brought us to a different uh, level or to a different platform, but we must be grateful. We must be grateful to God and must be grateful to the people who supported us, our family. Because the girl who was speaking for 50,000 girls in the Swat Valley when their education was banned by Taliban and more, for, more than 400 schools were bombed and destroyed, the same girl is now speaking for 130 million children who are not in school. So it's a great opportunity, but this was not planned or something. It's option B. You might have read Shel Sandberg book. Eh? It's option B, but we are very grateful. And as M M Malala always say, that this new life, I mean, if you know about the injury, the wound she got, the bullet entered here, it cut down her facial nerve, the air drum. And 18 inches, it traveled and embedded back in her shoulder. I mean, it's, I was watching television a few days ago and somebody fired from a pestle. And it, re it, 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 it revitalized, like, like, like it, uh, it, it brought back my trauma that, oh, it's fire. Like it's literally fire goes out of the pestle. So, it is a miracle that she survived, and she herself says that this life is for a purpose, and the purpose is grand, to see girls in school, completing their 12 years of education at least, and to choose for their, themselves whatever they want, to have the whole human dignity, which is their right. And that's why I always say that in patriarchal societies, many women die as if they had never been born. Why should one die without seeing this beautiful world, playing its role, enjoying it, having her happiness? We all have to stand for it. Speeches is getting long, please. So, hi, uh, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So, uh, my question is that as you, last year, you and your family went back to Pakistan in 2018, yes. and I know it must be very emotional, you very know, going back to the same helipad where Malala was uh, oh, taken goodness. off as, you know, and going to the same home, uh, of course. But how will you describe your family's maybe emotions and what you went through when you actually went back to the same home where you, you know, you have been living with your children? I am, you know, I live here in New York, being very far away from my country and my own family and being in exile, I can imagine, you know, what yes. happiness, but also like, you know, the emotions. Yes. Can you describe, you know, um, or maybe just share some moments from when you actually went back to Pakistan? Yeah, if I start sharing, it will be like very emotional too. But let me be very short. Like, we went back to our country after six and a half years. And leaving one country, one's country or homeland on your choice, uh, like intentionally for a job or seeking more opportunities in other countries, that is history old thing. People migrate, and this is a country of migrants, you know. But leaving one's homeland, forced to leave, or leaving for Malala's treatment, or because of the security reasons, it's so difficult. And before going to Pakistan, like for six and a half years, almost every second and third night, I used to be dreaming. This is something which I want to share with you. Dreaming myself to be in Shangla, in Swat, in Peshawar. And then in dream, I tell myself, this time it's not dream. I'm really here on, in pa 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 Pakistan. But again, it would have been dream. And when we went to Pakistan, somebody asked me, I told him, now it's really a dream <laughs> that we are there. And um, we met more than eight, 900 people. They came from Shangla, from Swat. Then we uh, flew to um, Swat. And we landed in the same helipad where Torpekai uh, was there standing on the rooftop while Malala was in seriously wounded. She was uh, taken uh, off in that uh, helicopter, and she spread her shawl, uh, which is very unusual, you know, and she spread her shawl in front of God and told God that, oh Allah, 
I gave her in your protection, and you have to guard her now. I want her back as strong as she was. So that was the time that we split, the family split, and then going back, this wholeness of the family, I mean, you are all your families. The wholeness of the family is a great happiness, is a blessing. So having this wholeness of the family in the same helicopter, landing on the same helipad, it was a very emotional moment. And we had a lot of hugs and kisses and, um, I mean, great moments. We really, really, it, it was remarkable, unforgettable. Thank you, Sava. Please, you can have this. Uh, at the time when Taliban were very active and Malala was writing and you were supporting, did you ever think that where it will end up? Or were you afraid at that time that it might happen because Taliban were like very aggressive and they were against uh, girls and women and were burning schools? So you were not afraid at that time? Uh, thank you. Uh, to be honest, like, um, of course, like we are all human beings, and the feeling of fear in such situations and circumstances is very natural. If I say no, I was very brave and I did not afraid of Taliban, and no, not at all. I did afraid, but then it comes to your values and what you believe in. It was scary to speak against Taliban and Talibanization and their supporters, but it was scarier not to speak against them. It was scarier. Just imagine Swat, which, is, which was called straight to the land of the East by Queen Elizabeth, and she had been there. Her husband has been there two times. I mean, that beautiful valley where queen could travel in the, on roads and in forest, a land of peace, a land of like a heaven on earth. When you living a life there and your daughter in school, your wife goes to the marketplace and few people, few bigot pe bigotry, I mean, few bigots come who call themselves Taliban and they say, no, girls will not be going to school. Ladies are not allowed in the marketplaces. CD shops are not allowed to be run. Music is banned. Statues and museums are pro, 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 prohibited. And even the, the, the clothes you wear should be according to the code we dictate you. I mean, can you imagine such things in New York? Tell me, can you imagine? And God forbid, and God forbid, and again, God forbid, if such things happen, one has to stand. Because I believe that living one day with human dignity is far better than hundreds of years in subjugation. We are human beings. We, it's our right. So those were the circumstances. Uh, though I, I, was, I was more worried about myself I thought that they will not come after a girl and a child. There are Pashtuns. Who are Pashtuns here? Saba and... Okay, no problem if I'm not Pashtuns. <laughs> we, are all, we are all human beings. We, they, these are just names. So who, I mean, in Pashto, Pashtun Wali, it's like a language, and Pashtun Wali is also code of life. And in Pashtun Wali, even in the worst feuds, in the worst fights, you are not supposed to attack a girl and a child. So it was an error of judgment on my behalf, I must say, that I thought that they will not come after a girl. But they knew that they wanted to silence uh, two people with one attack. They knew that if she goes away, this man who tries to speak the truth with his stuttered tongue, he will be gone then. But I mean, God had a different plan. Uh, and uh, like Taliban, who were afraid when, af afraid, they were really afraid of this one girl with a voice. Yes, yes. They were afraid in reality, because when you don't have argument and when you can't prove something with your reason, 
then you pick up a gun. Poor people pick up gun. Yeah. Uh, covered people pick up gun. Yeah. Brave people, brave human beings, they have argument. Yeah. They come with an argument. Mm -hmm. So that's why, I mean, uh, really, it was scary, but scarier not to speak. Uh, and yeah, you decide, you're the host. Yeah. Uh, my name is Khawar, and uh, uh, I really envy, or maybe a little jealous, that you were able to go back in six years. I couldn't make it 14 years now. Uh, I couldn't go back to Pakistan 14 years now. Okay. Uh, my question you is... You don't want to go or you, you can't go? I cannot. I cannot. Okay. So you can tell about that. Well, that is <laughs> not important. Okay. Issue is that you said that someone had to stand according to, uh, in those circumstances and you, you stood. I'm more interested to know about your journey, ideological, or whatever your commitments were. How you managed to stand? What was that strength? Where it came from? Who gave it to you? There are so many others. Pashtun and Swat, why it was only Zayuddin? Hmm. Some, uh, sometime I ask this question from myself, why me? But why not me, to be honest? Uh, I think that this was not only just me, there were few other elders of the Swat Valley, like one named Zaid Khan who got a bullet uh, on his neck and went out of his nose. Um, uh, I had a little bit of education I read about Martin Luther King, I read about Bacha Khan, I read about freedom fighters, I read about people who believed in their basic human rights, and I believed in democracy. Uh, um, I was an activist long before Talibanization, and it becomes very frustrating, like I was attached to many organizations I had an organization, Global Peace Council, and um, I, I was the president of the independent schools, all schools. And when you try, like your mission of life is to want to have more schools, and some people came, they destroy the schools which are already existing. That is the time that then you cannot tolerate it. Then one stands. Um, uh, and at that time, really, um, we were thinking of our heads that like when I used to m go uh, from my home to school, uh, we had three campuses, small campuses, and I used to change my ways, like sometime to one section, just my own strategy uh, that some bullet may come from somewhere and kill me. I spent nights with a friend uh, for almost uh, one and a half week because I didn't want to be killed in front of my family. I thought that if I'm killed, I'll be done. When you are killed and you are gone, then you don't think, you are not there. But this trauma that if I'm killed in front of my family, in front of my two sons and one daughter and my wife, they won't be able to come out of this trauma. And that's why I spent nights somewhere and coming back. So I should say that what inspired me, my rights inspired me. The belief in rights, that why should few people come and they say girls sh should not be educated. And then our anger was uh, uh, like also about the beginning days, how Taliban were supported by, uh, like by the government. Uh, so it was so stressful and we had to speak against it. Uh, you, you got your answer, I don't know. Still, no. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Khalil. Khalil. Um, thank you so much for your astonishing words. Uh, it's really an honor to uh, hear more about um, your uh, story. So my question is how you see the mother role um, 
towards their uh, girls, especially we know in our communities that mothers are sometimes are more powerful um, toward their girls, like how, how they should treat their children. Um, I mean, we heard about you, and uh, I would love to uh, hear more about your wife role. I'll translate you. Thank you. No, no, it's fine. She can speak on the phone. Yeah, you can. And your question is that uh, how a mother should play her role yeah. for. I mean, toward, toward their uh, children. More like the whole of the parasanga role for her. And if you don't mind, I will ask Sabah to stand and translate because I want to be, there should be an honest translation. Please, Sabah. No, no, I, it, it is, professionally it is uh, not uh, sound. Okay, she I'll, I'll try. Um, I cannot promise that I'll uh, true to be your words. <laughs> So Malala is uh, my my daughter, my friend, and uh, my, my and my sister. So you will actually uh, keep your child closer. You will also listen to the child, but you will also talk, but also listen to the child to your child. So if, uh, if you know, a child wants to uh, do something or have something, it's important that you talk with the child you know, softly, you listen to them, because if you try to force your own opinions or if you want to force something, uh, the child may go into wrong hands or might do something more like, you know, might, might do bad. So it's really important that you use your uh, language and you know, your words softly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, so uh, that there is no uh, difference between a girl child and a boy child, uh, you know, and a, and a son. Uh, the only difference is the pen. Uh, if a pen is given to both a son and, and a daughter, you know, there, there will be a difference. So um, that she, so Turpaka is saying that you know we are uh, I'm not educated, but the only difference between a man and a woman is that you know there is no difference. Uh, she's saying there are like two hands; they both have two hands, two you know feet, everything. But the only difference is the education, and that's you know if that's done, definitely there is a difference. <laughs> I hope I have done justice. I, uh, yeah. You did very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mike is coming to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering uh, on the issues of education and gender equality. Um, you know, there's still huge problems even here in America. Uh, so from the work you've been doing uh, around the world and from what you've seen in Pakistan, do you think things are improving well on those issues and do you have hope for the future? Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, sometimes we don't appreciate uh, slow, slow and silent change, but it always come. Um, I will give you one example that I never saw any girl going to school when I was a child. And I wish that if I had a girl student in my classroom, I mean, you don't mind, please. 
but like uh, as a schoolboy, because when we used to come to Mangora, there was a convent school. And in that convent school, boys and girls were getting education together with very nice clothes and like flying in the air. And I had this dream that would that I were here, but I was poor and like far away from Mingora. I could not be there. So the village I was growing up, I never saw a girl to be going to school. But right now, while we are here, only from the village where I was born, 250 girls are receiving their education. And not only that school, there are many other girls' schools as well. Things are changing, things are going well, and, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should be complacent, that everything is great. No, everything is not great. We all have to be working hard, striving hard. Um, we should not be hopeless. Uh, but we should work hard. I gave an example and Taylor liked it so much that in the, maybe it fits or not, but I'm just telling it. Uh, in the West, like which is called Global North, uh, how they define these South and North, but you know what it means. In the Global North, uh, you, uh, you talk about glass ceiling. You know glass ceiling, okay? Uh, it is not always uh, patriarchy or uh, re 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 religious extremism uh, that uh, marginalize women and girls. Uh, we see like uh, misogyny, sexism, uh, male chauvinism in the workplaces um, uh, in America, in many other countries. Uh, so here we have glass ceiling. Uh, they are not equal opportunities. Uh, uh, not many girls and women are on the top positions, but something has been achieved here. Like, uh, girls are not supposed to be just, it's not a social norm that you keep a girl inside the house. She goes out. It's not a norm that a girl must be escorted by a male member, even that member is uh, like twice younger than a woman. It doesn't happen here. So here is the glass ceiling, but there in countries like Afghanistan or Pakistan or other countries, once we had iron, bar, iron, iron, iron blinds, they couldn't see anything beyond four walls. Now there are iron bars. They can see light outside, but they are struggling to break those bars and be free. And one day they will be free. Yes, I'm very hopeful. They'll be free. Things change. Birds will sing. Spring will come. Definitely. I think we can do uh, one more question before we sign yeah. books. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Hassan Saab. Thank yes. you so. Well, thank you so much. It's really impressive, and I'm so influenced, overtaken. Thank you. You, early, uh, you, you mentioned earlier um, uh, the, the people, are, uh, the ideals who have you know, influenced you, you, the people like Nelson yes. Mandela and yes. locally, yes. Bacha Khan, Khan yes. Abdul Ghaffar yes. Khan. So my question is that how far the, the people are the giants like Bacha Khan, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan and other Gandhi and other pride of our Pakhtuns and all the subcontinents of freedom loving people there, especially their um, their attitudes, especially their work, uh, are being secular and being nice toward women because we see in history that Bajah Khan, long time ago in 1930s or 1920s, sent his daughter to be taught in a madrasa with the boys and then he sent his, his daughter to Isabel Thavran College, Lucknow. Yes. And those days, and even her, even his um, daughter-in-law, Begum Khan, Naseem Ali Khan also, you know, took to the streets and agitation yes. and all this stuff. So how, how, how much these giants in history have shaped, uh, worked shaping up your thinking and also influence Malala? I just want to know. Yeah, definitely. We all, to some extent, are influenced by the great minds, great people who contributed, who contributed to human dignity, equality, peace in our history. And uh, there are always two options to be on the right side of the history or onto the wrong side of the history. I personally think that my father told me great stories about these inspirational people because he had been in India 
as a student of Islamic education. And uh, when I was in school, like 13, 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, a lot of things were happening in my life, like coming across this beautiful woman, Torpekai. <laughs> Don't mind, it's fine. Uh, like I was very, I had a great inferiority complex that I am that handsome, but once she uh, just uh, showed that, oh, you are okay, I was so happy. <laughs> The first woman in my life, okay? And the last, hopefully. Uh, so these things were happening, and also I was uh, taught by uh, Maulana, uh, Islamic education or theology, and those were the days of uh, Suet Afghan war, which was a proxy war on Pashtun land and Afghan land. Uh, Russia was there, not Russia, Soviet Union was there, America, uh, CIA and then Pakistan was used like it's becoming political but that was a situation when madrasas were radicalized and everything was jihadized like uh, uh, it was romanticized like jihad became the the, 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 the the whole and the sole thing of Islam otherwise it is not in the basics of Islam it's not in the basic five basic of Islam my teacher was teaching me and I became so radicalized that I used to pray to God. After every prayer, oh God, let there be a war, a fight between Muslims and non-Muslims, and I am be killed to become a martyr. I was still peaceful, I didn't want to kill anyone, but I wanted to be killed. And then later on when I came across some people who were from like secular parties, who believed in democracy, in politics, in human rights, I changed. I changed and then I used to pray, oh God, give me long life. <laughs> so these are well, the circumstances. Uh, the need of the hour is that whether it is in India or whether it's Pakistan, I think uh, in that region, along with Bangladesh, uh, it's like huge population. Uh, if we, have, we are um, six billion people, out of them maybe two billion live there, I mean, almost, in these three countries. And uh, you see, they, the children of these countries need the, the, the thoughts and learnings of the legendary leaders like Gandhiji, uh, like Bacha Khan, uh, like Tagore and great leaders in that region who can inspire our children to be more tolerant, to be more peaceful, because hatred, extremism, uh, intolerance is such a bad thing that it brings fear in people's hearts. And it is so difficult to live with fear. And it is so lovely to live in peace and to live with joy and happiness. With these words, thank you so much to everyone. To everyone.